can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. They were to try and channel it for the old man. The men of the new deny what they think is the only argument that they can afford. It's not going to happen. Free and uncorrupted communication. now also have uh, the delight of introducing our moderator for this afternoon, uh, Sarah Pritchard, uh, who is the university librarian at UCSB. Uh, and she has been since 1999. Uh, before coming to UCSB, she was the director of libraries at Smith College and had previously worked at the Library of Congress and the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, she's active in many major initiatives of the Association of Research Libraries, the Coalition for Networked Information, and the University of California, the entire University of California library system. Um, and she's held numerous uh, positions in the American Library Association. Just currently, she chairs the Committee on Professional Ethics and has just completed three terms on the American Library Association Council. Uh, in California, she's a gubernatorial appointee to the State Board of the Library of California Multi-Type Cooperative Network. In 2001, Sarah Pritchard was selected by the Association of College and Research Libraries to receive the Career Achievement Award in Women's Studies Librarianship. Uh, she served on uh, several grant and editorial review panels and is the author of over 70 articles and reviews on library management, information technology, uh, women's studies librarianship, and consortial library projects. Sarah. Thank you, Connie. Uh, it's really my distinct pleasure to have been involved with this series over the course of the year because clearly issues of control of the media and therefore the impact that that has on access to information is of direct relevance to those of us who try to gather and distribute uh, that information for research and teaching uh, through academic libraries. So this has been a fascinating opportunity to interact across the publishers and providers, the creators, the users uh, of all of these forms of scholarly information. We're going to touch on more of those issues in the next panel where we look at uh, issues of access, oppositional media, uh, and the particular role of newspapers. Uh, our first speaker uh, will be Leah Livro. She's a professor in the Department of Information Studies at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. Uh, her research and writing focuses on the social and cultural changes associated with information and communication technologies and the relationship between new technologies and knowledge. Uh, Dr. Livro is co-editor of the Handbook of New Media, Social Shaping and Consequences of ICTs. I should have looked up that acronym before I read it. Interactive Communication Technologies? Information and Communication Technologies. And her other books include uh, Mediation, Information and Communication, Information and Behavior, and Competing Visions, Complex Realities, Social Aspects of the Information Society. She's an editor of the journal New Media and Society. So I think you can see uh, the great range of interdisciplinary interests that we will now hear in her presentation. Leah. Good afternoon, and I'm very pleased that we're all here after a nice lunch. It's usually the time when I get a little sleepy, but I will try to make sure that uh, what I've got to say uh, is intriguing enough that it might keep you awake and might prompt a few questions. Um, I'll get this started. Actually, before I do that, um, I just want to frame uh, my comments here to begin with by talking about what uh, 
I think is kind of a subtext of what's been going on all morning, and I expect we're going to continue to hear more about this this afternoon in the subsequent uh, talks. But one of the things that we're talking about here when we talk about media ownership is the relationship between the ownership of the material infrastructure, the built systems, media systems, information technology systems, and the kind of content that is generated, circulated, consumed, played with, what have you, uh, that is possible using those systems. And the question I think that we are all trying to grapple with is whether and to what extent those patterns of ownership of material resources are reflected in the symbolic, in the content resources, right? Because on one hand, what gets everybody upset, I think, is the content. What everybody is really concerned about is the ideas, in what is the nature of our culture, in what is the quality of the ideas, in um, the ways that these ideas circulate and our politics and sort of the ramifications through society. But because of our legal system, uh, we in fact don't regulate content per se in all circumstances, but we can do something, we can regulate, we can shape the ownership, the structures, the systems, and that's what we're doing. We're kind of getting to one through the other, I think. And so one of the things that I think was particularly interesting about the first um, session this morning with Ellie Noam and Denise uh, Bilby um, was that on one hand I, hear, I heard Ellie talking about infrastructure and about built things and about you know the structures of things and the ownership of things and um, uh, and on the other hand Denise was talking more about content and the nature of the kinds of materials that are circulating and what that infrastructure has supported and what I want to suggest today is that um, we still seem to be talking about this primarily in terms of uh, mass media models, mass media institutions, mass media ideas about how content is made and circulated. And what I want to suggest to you today is that when we get into the area of the internet, which has been alluded to, it's kind of, as I said over lunch, I think today, I said it's kind of a stalking horse over here in the corner about media ownership. It's, a, it's in a different place, but we're all kind of know it's the elephant in the room, if you will, right? And I think that what is most interesting about the introduction of newer kinds of infrastructure, newer kinds of technologies that bring in telecommunications and uh, networked computing, is that they change. I'm not quite completely sure what kind of change, but they certainly seem to me to change that relationship between the built things and the content. And so the kinds of regulatory solutions we've had the kinds of expectations about speech, about property, all of that are kind of in the air right now when we move, you know, they're, they're fairly certain legislatively, legally, as we heard today, when we're talking about sort of the mainstream entertainment content businesses, or now they're calling themselves content businesses, but if you're, if you're thinking about publishing or broadcasting and so forth. But when we get over into ICTs, information and communication technologies, more broadly, we begin to see a little bit of a shift in the landscape, and that's what I want to explore with you today. All right, I'm going to just give you a couple of quotes that you can read here um, up front. Uh, about my uh, example that I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, the phrase that I'm using for these is oppositional new media. That is the idea that some of these technologies, some of these tools are being used by activists, artists, social groups, people who have interests to be able to advance those interests when they feel that their views are not adequately represented by the kinds of systems that we heard a lot about this morning. Um, and so you see a lot of uses now of new technologies, of online technologies, to uh, try and advance very different, very diverse kinds of points of view online where the mass media, as we heard this morning, there's, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Epstein was saying, there's no necessary access to broadcasting if you're just a citizen, right? And yet here we have a different kind of system that says, yes, anybody can have access. So this is a wonderful little quote from Umberto Eco from a number of years ago, and um, I thought it was uh, very appropriate for today. Um, 
once upon there once upon a time there were the mass media etc and now it's different put differently some of you may be familiar with Guy Debord the uh, French uh, situationist uh, philosopher and activist in his own right and writer and uh, in many ways his uses uh, of um, collage and what he called detournement of different kinds of media images to in fact criticize the mainstream uh, he's kind of the granddaddy of, of many of the kinds of uses that we see online today and this is a phrase from him so that's me and I want to talk about uh, reconfiguration we'll get to that in a minute but what I would like to begin with is something of an overview and this may be fairly familiar to those of you that are uh, who have been online for a long time or have, uh, are very familiar with the origins of what we now think of as the internet but of course that has a very long history but in the 1990s um, when the World Wide Web was introduced, um, this was circa 92, 93, um, the internet had been around, of course, already for probably 20 years in terms of the network of networks created um, really through uh, defense money and developed on American uh, uh, campuses, um, computer science departments and so forth. But in the 1990s is where we really begin to see uh, that, that system, those, those systems, those capabilities, those kinds of tools, made available to all kinds of people who didn't consider themselves particularly tech savvy or consider themselves computer people. As uh, we divide ourselves in our department still, it's mainly a library, uh, library and information science department, and there's the book people and the computer people, and then there's a crew of us that says, who doesn't love all, all of those things, you know? But um, people that didn't even consider themselves computer people began for the first time to um, uh, encounter these technologies and incorporate them into their everyday life and into their work and into entertainment and leisure and so forth. And in the 1990s, as these systems uh, really proliferated and spread right through lots of different kinds of social settings, two different visions developed about what the world was going to be like uh, given this uh, new form of mediation as it was seen. On one hand, you had the kind of frontier discourse. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, you may be familiar with, adopted that discourse explicitly that said, you know, there's something about these systems. They are decentralized. They're not like the big mainframe systems of years ago. Everybody who's got a desktop, everybody who's got one of these devices has some computing power. When you hook it up to the network, which is basically a telecommunications network, suddenly you are able to distribute ideas, distribute computing power. Um, and this network, in fact, the structure of it, a lot of people saw as somehow inherently empowering and inherently democratic. There's still a lot of this belief, of course, um, in the activist community. Uh, the thought was that there was going to be really an unprecedented opportunity uh, for marginalized groups, for groups that had not been able to get access to the mainstream media, to uh, get over those very high barriers to entry, the cost, the uh, production um, expenses and uh, complexity uh, that broadcasting and publishing had, had previously imposed. Um, so here was an opportunity. These would also provide new channels for interaction. One of the things that we now know that is most powerful about uh, what we think of as new media or the internet is that it's not just a, a, you know, a, a way to deliver materials. It also supports interpersonal interaction. And this is, and Ron knows this probably better than almost anyone, computer-mediated communication in the sense of person-to-person uh, -person or small group or distributed groups over time and space. This has really been a, a pretty substantive change uh, in terms of the ways we interact uh, through mediated systems. So we have these new channels introduced. And this idea of the frontier uh, was, was very powerful um, in this early period. At the same time, you had the kinds of industries that were already in what uh, Ellie called this morning the information sector, right? And publishers were already there, broadcasters were there, um, entertainment businesses, movie industry, record industry, all these people were there already. And they had a business model, they had a, an idea in mind, they already knew how to do some things very well. And for them, they looked at the internet and they saw a pipeline. They said, here's a new way for us to get to even more closely target, to really reach 
audiences in a way that we have not been able to do through sort of a more shotgun method through broadcasting or, or mass marketing, as it were. Um, in this vision, we have the idea that content distribution and delivery and sales and so forth could still be coming from a few centralized sources. Um, that revenues could continue to come from advertising. I think this is still kind of an iffy question when it comes to where the money is going to come from, but increasingly what we're finding is that people are thinking about the materials produced in terms of intellectual property. The property metaphor has been extended, as we'll see, uh, pretty substantially, and that now, the rights to things have become as important as the materials themselves in terms of revenue generation. In fact, a lot of critics have said what has been going on over the last decade is that as the mainstream media organizations have gotten a little more savvy about the technology, they've been busily trying to shore up the model they have of distribution. Um, where they didn't quite understand how the system was going to work or where they saw a threat to their uh, world, as with Napster, let's say, um, they went out against it and tried to shut it down until they could figure out a way to manage it make it work for them. Um, but in the meantime, kind of this mass distribution, mass production model was still in place. And the idea was that through the kinds of cross-ownership we've been hearing about this morning, we would end up with this magic word, synergies. Um, and we'd end up also with the situation that we find today with more concentrated ownership, cross-promotion across platforms and across genres of, of content. Um, it was interesting to me, Ellie, to see this morning that, that little blip in just the, I think you said the information uh, industries, is that right? The, no, internet industries um, since 1996. Actually, they've gone up over the, the little 1800 threshold there. Kind of an interesting uh, piece of evidence. Today, um, what I would like to suggest is that there is, there's kind of a tension between these two visions. Neither vision is really one out 100%. And what we've ended up with is a situation where more and more people, as they become more facile with the technology, as they become more comfortable with it, more familiar with it, um, they are using it and adapting it in ways that many of the people, both in the frontier idea and on the pipeline idea, really didn't anticipate was going to happen. And what we are beginning to see is, a, is kind of a big blooming, I think, of a lot of materials that are in response, as it says here, reflection, critique, parody, rejoinder. So a lot of people are finding their voices uh, who would never have thought that they would have an audience in the old uh, sense. Um, and these uses of new technologies today really are kind of a bottom-up uh, phenomenon. They are not something that has been prepackaged and marketed. They are uh, evolving even as we speak. And in fact, critically, uh, they, are, they have been very in influenced, as it says here, by the earlier traditions of activist art, of alternative media that goes back quite a long way. This is not a new phenomenon by any means. It's rather a, w a new way to frame, a new way to, um, to make their points. Let me just go very quickly, um, because I want to get to the point about ownership here. But I want to go quickly through what we might think about as genres of this kind of oppositional use of new media technologies. Um, these, again, may be familiar to some of you. Some of you may, be, in fact, be involved in doing these very things. Culture jamming. Not exclusive to the internet, not exclusive online. Certainly we see this in publications. We see it in you know, people who reconfigure billboards. But the notion here is to take the images, the ideas, the phraseology, the sort of popular culture business that we see every day and convert it, to turn it against itself, and to be ironic with it, and to parody, okay? Um, and I mentioned Debord before, Detournement is uh, definitely uh, brought to bear here. Some of you may be familiar with the, um, the cartoon uh, that first appeared, I think, well, it was on, online originally, and now I think it was picked up by Rolling Stone in print, but I think it still it remains online, Get Your War On, where it's all clip art. The person sat in his office and he would sort of take generic clip art and make comic strip cartoons, only having this ranting kind of text, this sort of angry, upset um, uh, commentary on current events, politics, so forth. Um, same kind of thing if you know about Artmark, 
there's a group called the Surveillance Camera Players. Some of you, uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, but the idea there is that they <laughs> will go in front of, say, a camera that's mounted at an ATM or in a subway station or something and do plays. They know someone's on the other end, but who, who knows? Um, Mark Derry has a very well-known essay manifesto that he has online uh, called Culture Jamming, if you want to know more about that. But that's kind of uh, one version of this, where you take material from the prevailing culture, turn it around, change the meaning, shift it a little bit, and feed it back, and put it, uh, kind of send it back into the channels. Okay, the recontextualization here is very important. Another genre that I, I'm, I'm increasingly persuaded is kind of emerging um, very much as, as a cultural form as much as a, technolo a technological practice is alternative computing. And it was just last year that I really heard it described this way. Um, it is not only hacking, although this uh, slide tends to uh, emphasize that part of it, but the free software movement. The idea of open source um, uh, software being developed, hacktivism, which is um, hacking with the intent, as it says here, of exposing institutional wrongdoing, doing it with a purpose. Um, people who will expose, some of you may know about Easter eggs, lately that term has been uh, kind of co-opted by the entertainment business to kind of insert little cute things that you can find on DVDs and so forth, but it really began among software writers who would put uh, uh, little pieces of code into mainstream software because they didn't have any credits or they weren't liking the particular way a product was going and you had to be kind of inside to know how to trigger the, uh, the Easter egg to, to do its thing. Probably one of the, the most well-known ones, earliest ones, was that there was a particular keystroke combination in one of the versions of Microsoft Word that would take you to a flight simulator like out of the blue, and if you didn't know what you had done and suddenly you went to a flight, who knew? But very often people would build in like rolling credits all of a sudden, you know, there would be some combination of things and presto, there would be all the people who worked on this who otherwise would never have actually gotten any credit for the work. Um, Microsoft now, apparently, in the last couple of years, it got so rampant within Microsoft uh, software that they've sort of started cracking down and looking for Easter eggs and anyone who is, uh, you know, accused of doing this uh, kind of gets bounced pretty quickly. But alternative computing is really within the engineering and the software design community. This is uh, uh, kind of their own version of oppositional uses. Mediated mobilization, that's kind of a fancy phrase for it, but increasingly we are finding people uh, using online technologies to link with other people. I mean, from a social network point of view, this has really been kind of a bonanza. Um, Everyone has social networks, everyone has multiple social networks, but now we have a technological platform that allows people to sort of get together and to uh, meet each other in ways that maybe they couldn't have done before. And so we are seeing more things like mobbing, more things like meetups, which have been very useful in, uh, of course, in the last presidential campaign, uh, Howard Dean and his people were using meetup technology uh, quite well, Friendster, those kinds of things. But this is, this is very different from that model that says, you know, what the media are about is content that you deliver. And indie media, this has also uh, been, the ta been uh, talked about quite a bit. Um, there's now some, there's probably over a hundred indie media sites online that are really considered very formal news organizations, but they, again, they've been very bottom up. Um, what happens in this case is that uh, people will take the forms and conventions of mainstream journalism, but they are amateurs. They will represent particular interest groups, or uh, let's say there are some very interesting indie media sites, for example, among uh, in uh, developing nations, Muslim women. There's a really good one uh, done by Muslim women, for example, uh, in the Middle East. But they will pick up these conventions of journalism, of documentary and commentary, and then build what looks like newspapers or documentaries or so forth, become a news service, as it were, to represent a different point of view on possibly the very same issues that are being covered in the mainstream. Increasingly, the major news organizations, too, are watching these and picking up from them and watching them to look for news stories, to look for kind of news pegs that are out in the fringes where their own uh, reporters may not uh, be very familiar.
Um, so the point of indie media is then to allow alternative perspectives and places and people and voices to present their point of view to a wider arena. Okay, it's not quite the same thing as mass media. It's not the same thing as putting out an evening new newscast and knowing however many millions are going to be watching at a particular time. But it is certainly a very much more effective way for these groups to be heard than um, the mainstream media have been in the past. The other thing that's important about these is that the hyperlinking um, function that we're all familiar with online is used very effectively in these sites, and this is true right across all these genres actually, um, for the people designing the sites to recommend other things. Not too often do we see the New York Times saying, well, to read more on this, go to this other publication, you know, go watch this TV show, sometimes. But that's not as much a part of the a central part of the way that they construct their message. It's very, very central to um, this kind of this kind of work, and it does grow. I think a very good case has been made by people like Chris Atten and Geert Loving, um, John Downing, uh, that this really comes out of a longer tradition of alternative press, alternative media, um, but uh, with a very different kind of technological base now, and with a very different potential audience. And the cases, the examples here, you know, we are all familiar with blogs. We're uh, familiar with sort of independent uh, commentary and news sites. Wikis in increasingly are an interesting thing where people are compiling information and creating resources, really kind of documentary resources, library style or encyclopedia style, um, but from a particular point of view or in a particular place. I'm going to spin through these features. Um, uh, because I'm just for the sake of time. Because I want to get back to this question of media ownership and the model that we typically think about when we are talking about um, media ownership. It seems to me that when I hear people who are concerned about concentration of ownership, and you know, as we heard this morning, this is not a new, by no means is it a new issue. Um, what is happening is that we are talking about um, a situation where the control of a wide range of resources, and typically, certainly in communication studies for a long time, it's been thought about as the infrastructure, the ownership of the systems, the ownership of the machinery, the ownership of the, the corporate organizations. Uh, the control of a big chunk of resources by a relatively small number of players. Okay. Um, and furthermore, it's ordinarily the case that it is the control of the material resources of the printing presses, of the computers, if you will, of the TV stations, we've been hearing this today, of the, the presses, um, of the uh, broadcast infrastructure, so forth and so on, of the production infrastructure, as Denise was talking about, you know, uh, who is doing the writing and who, how these things are being produced and who's got the studios, who's got the facilities to actually make television shows. And the ownership of those facilities, of those material resources, is then what is thought to give you the ability to be a gatekeeper for content. The old line says, freedom of the press belongs to the person who owns the press. Okay? Uh, we may have speech rights, but unless you've got the means to actually get your voice out there, it's kind of moot, some people would say. So I think this has been kind of the conventional relationship that we, we think about when we think about media ownership. We, we kind of foreground the ownership of, of material resources as a way to say, well then, there are implications, there are outcomes, there are going to be consequences for the kinds of content and the kinds of ideas and the kinds of culture that we're going to end up with. Um, so what we have under this kind of set of assumptions is that um, when we think about it in terms of mass media, when we think about it in terms of publishing or broadcasting or, or uh, um, the film industry, et cetera, television uh, production industry, these are relatively concentrated. They're high barriers to entry, as the economists will say. You know, it costs a lot to do these things. There's a lot of material stuff that's involved. And so the infrastructures involved are very capital intensive. Not very many people can just start up a movie studio. You know, maybe today it's a little earlier, easier than it used to be. Television networks, you know, you're not just getting into that game very easily. And so we have this control of infrastructure. Um, increasingly, it's not just the infrastructure either. They're beginning to think about not only 
owners are thinking about not only the property factor or the pro thinking about the material resources in terms of property, they're thinking about the symbolic resources, the content resources in terms of property. So the property metaphor is every place, you know, in this model. And therefore, that's what enables gatekeeping. And so under this set of conditions, when we talk about access, and I've argued in a paper recently in a book chapter that the word access is really a portmanteau kind of word. You know, we use it for everything. We use it to mean, you know, dial tone for the telephone. We mean it to, we use it to mean um, literacy. We use it to mean computer skills. Lots of things come under the, the realm of access. But generally, in this conventional model that we're talking about, it means consuming products that have been, you know, they're media and cultural products. Um, when we insert the newer kinds of point-to-point -point technologies, the sort of networked telecommunications, computing, incorporating and, and converging with other kinds of uh, long-standing kinds of uh, infrastructures, now we're moving toward a more, a more decentralized kind of point-to-point -point configuration where content can happen anywhere in the system. It's not a center out, it's not a top down, it's anywhere in the system. Any point to any other point can be a producer and a consumer. We hear this all the time, but it actually is a very different way to think about mediation. It's a very different way to think about our cultural milieu um, versus the consumption model, which is kind of uh, the usual kind of thing that we hear talked about. Um, in fact, the rewards in some of these systems, and certainly among the communities that I'm talking about here, may not take the form of, of money. It may be in terms of reputation. If you, there's all kinds of studies coming out now about sort of the reputation economy within the open source movement. Um, gift economies. You know, I'll give you uh, this little solution to a problem if you'll share something back. You have to share it with the whole community. Those kinds of things. Um, the ability to have a voice in the first place is, is really a big benefit for a lot of people. And the fact that these technologies, as I said before, don't only link content or provide content, they link people in content complexly, you know, in lots of different constantly changing ways. Under this kind of situation, under this change configuration, access is a different matter. Instead, it shifts to rather than just consumption, now we're talking about I only have access if I have the means to go and play with this thing, right? To go create this silly PowerPoint presentation and maybe I can post it on my website and maybe I can send it to my mom or maybe it'll show up on a DVD or may whatever. But all of a sudden I've got a very different kind of voice than I would have done 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I need affordances. I need ways in. I need little places where I can tinker. I need places where I can reconfigure, co-opt, grab content, change it, play with it, critique it, intervene, recombine it with other things. And I want opportunities to go find anybody else that I need to find in the world that I think might be interested in what I'm doing. And that's precisely the sort of infrastructure we've built for ourselves. We have these expectations in society now that it's really not so much a hierarchy as it is kind of a big broad network and it's not so much that the the, the uh, technology drives us in that direction I think it's more the fact that we expect our society to be like that and we've built something now that allows us to exercise that vision. In this situation I like this quote from Jessica Littman some of you are probably pretty familiar with her work on uh, on intellectual property but I, I'm very intrigued by this statement that she makes in one of her recent books, that in these situations, and this probably actually goes back certainly before um, the internet, before we have um, you know, com computing networks to be talking about or new media, but the kinds of rules that are being put into place to control communication, to control interaction, to control the kinds of things that are circulated, the ideas, are increasingly being captured under a model, a property model. Uh, as I was saying before, not only the objects themselves, but the rights to the objects, the ideas of the objects. The ideas of the ideas, you know, are increasingly the things we own. And so Jessica, I think, says very sensibly, the rules that we are making uh, 
are so counterintuitive at this point that people just, they don't buy it. <laughs> they disobey because they, it just doesn't seem reasonable. And yet we are having to actively defend things like fair use, which we've taken for granted for a very long time, for sale principles. That, you know, there's a lot of the people I know who are IP lawyers who think that's going to go away. Um, under in the current situation. So there's a lot of people on one hand who are the professionals and the people in sort of the mainline media industries who are really trying to extend a property model. Meanwhile, in the general culture, people are playing rip, mix, burn kind of things more than ever before. So let me just, this is my last little point here. Ron asked all of us to say, what are your key, you know, your big light bulb ideas? And I don't know that these are more than about 10 watts, but um, let me suggest a couple of things. First of all, and there's one more bullet point that I, I didn't get around to adding here. First of all, the notion of recombination. Um, in uh, the Handbook of New Media, Sonia Livingstone and I have um, made the argument. We did a couple of years ago, but in the new uh, student version that's coming out, we've rewritten the introduction to really lean on this much more uh, strongly. That one of the characteristics of the current climate is this sense of recombination, of taking things, of bricolage, of, of collage, of taking things and putting, taking things apart, putting things together in new ways. And so in that situation, I think we have to think increasingly about ownership, not just in terms of big blocks of industries or static kinds of entities, but the fact that both the material infrastructures are being reconfigured, tinkered with, hacked, worked around, all the time. This is one of the real genius things, in fact, about these new technologies, is that so many of us have the affordances to get in and play with them. That wasn't true with television. It was hardly true with publishing, so forth. So that kind of tinkering and reconfiguration is kind of a fact of life right now. At the same time, we're seeing more and more of what uh, Jay Bolter has called remediation of content, where you kind of pick from the big milieu. You go around and you shop for the ideas and the, the images and the sound clips or whatever it is that you want and you recombine it and this is kind of the essence of creativity in fact. And we have these kinds of tools to be creative and I think we have to think about ownership increasingly not in, term, in static terms but in these constantly evolving terms. This newer infrastructure, at least to date, depending on how it ends up being regulated, so far it's not regulated very much but there are some pressures to go in that direction. It resists the fixation of these resources, the stabilization of these resources, which is precisely what mass media in their main industrial form have done. They really kind of lock things down. And so our ownership model um, uh, has some things to worry about. Here I've just mentioned the property versus speech kind of contention. But let me say one last thing and then I'll, I'll, I'm done. And that is the kinds of, and in fact, uh, Denise's paper really got me thinking about this quite a bit this morning. Um, we have thought about ownership in terms of flows of production and consumption, flows of, of things, flows of, or the movement or the distribution of products. And in fact, while those kinds of measurements, we've been saying this morning how important it is for us to measure the right things when it comes to ownership, to know what it is that we're dealing with, and to really engage empirically. Um, in fact, it seems to me high time for us to do other kinds of measures, network measures of patterns and shifts, dynamic measures if necessary, of both people and content. We need to be measuring not only products, we need to be measuring relations relations inside of content, relations among people, relations of both together. Um, some of you may have read uh, the little book by, that Bernardo Huberman uh, did a couple of years ago called Laws of the Web. And for those of us that do social networks, of course, we know about power laws and we know about cumulative advantage and we know about these kinds of things. But I was really impressed by the fact that in this little book, a man who's a very uh, skilled communicator and engineer says, look, here's the ways that we measure now. You know, It's not just enough to say how much of something is there. We have to engage with this constant movement, with this kind of, these multi-way flows, these n-way flows. And so the relational aspects need to be measured as much as the products themselves or the quantification. So I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>
thank you, Leah. Uh, Anne Louise Bardock was unavoidably delayed on the East Coast and could not be here today. Uh, she was to have spoken about the key issues that were presented two weeks ago in an earlier event in this series, which was a panel of newspaper and magazine editors. Uh, we're very grateful that Connie Penley, who was one of the organizers of that panel, uh, is going to take Annie's place and report on the same topic. Now you've seen Connie up here already and, and you've um, heard her, uh, but you haven't actually had an introduction to her, so it is now my pleasure uh, to give her a real introduction. Uh, Constance Penley is Professor of Film Studies and Director of the Center for Film Television, co-director of the Center for Film Television and New Media at UC Santa Barbara. Her major areas of research interest are film history and theory, feminist theory, cultural studies, contemporary art, and science and technology studies. She's a founding editor of Camera Obscura, Feminism Media Cultural Studies. Her most recent work includes NASA Trek, Popular Science and Sex in America, and The Visible Woman, Imaging Technologies, Science and Gender. Her collaborative art projects include Melrose Space, Primetime Art by the Gala Committee, and Biospheria, an environmental opera on which she was the co-librettist. Co Connie. Matt? Great, okay. So we're all very sorry that um, Anne Louise Bardak, Penn award-winning author and journalist, uh, who's also the director of the Media Project of the Center for Film, Television, and New Media, uh, that she was delayed uh, in getting back here uh, for today's presentation. I'm going to attempt to channel Anne Louise Bardak and for any of you here who know Annie, you will comprehend that this is a formidable task and that my head may explode. Uh, Annie worked with us uh, to organize the panel that uh, Sarah was mentioning to you that took place on May 7th uh, with some of the key decision makers uh, in America's newsrooms. Uh, Annie moderated the panel along with Virginia Postrel former editor of Reason and columnist for the New York Times and Forbes. Uh, the members of the panel were Lionel Barber, U.S. Managing Editor for the Financial Times, Bill Keller, Executive Editor of the New York Times, and Jacob Weisberg, the editor of Slate, which the Washington Post just recently bought from uh, Microsoft. Uh, the panel uh, was part of our year-long series on media ownership, research, and regulation. And the panel was titled Media Ownership, Media Bias, A Crisis in the Newsroom. I'm going to try to give you a critical summary of the main points that came out in the discussion, uh, highlighting some of the things that these top news editors said that surprised me, and I think surprised a lot of other people in the audience as well. Now we didn't pick these three editors as exemplary of the whole field of news gathering and dissemination. And as you'll see uh, in what I'm going to be telling you and showing you, they weren't very representative at all. Uh, we wanted to focus with this panel on print and online news, uh, but plan to continue this series uh, with events around blogging and journalism, but this time more from the side of the bloggers, um, localism and media, and uh, with the UC Santa Barbara Walter Capps Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life, an event on religion and media. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play you uh, two short um, uh, excerpts from the panel discussion. And the panel discussion was captured by, was recorded for NPR, UCTV, and C-SPAN. Uh, and you can also get it streaming from our website soon. So uh, everybody can catch up on it. How many people here were at that panel? Okay, a few people. Um, so I want to start off by playing the very beginning of the panel discussion, where we get our first surprise. Uh, we realized afterwards that we 
perhaps should have put a question mark in the title of the panel. Media ownership, media bias, a crisis in the newsroom? Uh, because if our panelists thought there was a crisis in the newsroom because of the current structure of media ownership, it wasn't the way people usually envision it. Okay, now where we're going to start in the tape is uh, Anne-Louise Bardak has just asked the first question. Uh, she preceded it with a cautionary tale about what happens when the corporate owner of a great newspaper that breaks big stories and has international bureaus everywhere decides that it isn't making enough money. 18% profit is not enough. It has to be pushed to 22 or 25%. The newsroom gets eviscerated. The foreign bureaus close down. Talent flees. Her example was Knight Ritter and the Miami Herald, but much the same thing happened with other Knight Ritter, formerly great newspapers, such as the Philadelphia Inquirer and the San Jose Mercury News. She poses the, the, she poses the question first to Lionel Barber, and then we'll hear from Bill Keller and Jacob Weisberg. Okay, uh, could you start the tape now, Matt? Does having a free press mean that media owners are permitted unfettered free reign to optimize profits? Um, is that, was that really the, the intent of our founding fathers? And Lionel, I guess I ask, I ask, is there a corporate model that guarantees profits but also preserves the integrity of the newsroom and of the news gathering process? <laughs> Well, I, obviously, I speak largely uh, from my experience as a British journalist, uh, admittedly someone who's, who's spent a lot of time in America. But I think that something important happened in American journalism in the early 70s, late 70s, when a number of companies decided that they needed to go public to tap the capital markets to raise money. Yeah. And this changed the calculations made in the executive boardrooms. Previously, private companies were under nowhere near the same kind of pressure to generate the kind of returns that they are now expected to generate, and that certainly applies to a company like Knight Ritter. I just say one other thing about the uh, Financial Times, which is indeed owned by a larger organization, a publishing group called Pearson, it actually, its, its origins lie, by the way, in engineering, uh, not, not, in, not in publishing. And Pearson uh, expects us to be profitable, but it does not expect us uh, to make the kinds of re rates of return uh, which are expected today in this country, which can range up to 25%. Right. Right. And indeed, in the full uh, uh, spirit of transparency, I should say that the Financial Times group, largely as a result of a steep drop in advertising revenue, has actually lost money for the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't had the kind of direct proprietorial in, in, interventions uh, to uh, uh, take away from our quality journalism. I'm yeah. interested also in Bill Keller and, and Jacob Weisberg on the same question. Is there a corporate model that can give profits to the owners and also guarantee some you know, the, the integrity of the news gathering process, uh, if you feel that's something you want to comment on. Well, I, I speak from a, the position of a somewhat lucky man in that, I mean, but certainly one answer to that question is to have your corporation owned by a family uh, that controls all of the voting stock and that takes the legacy of serious journalism seriously. Uh, I mean, what, the result of that is that our profit margins I think are considerably lower than Knight Ritter's or Scripps Howard or the Tribune Company. Uh, but so far anyway, the company has been willing to put up with that. Although, you know, I, I, I think Lionel's absolutely right that there was a, a, a turning point when the big media companies went public. But the interesting thing now is that if you walked into most of the big news organizations in America or to the places like the American Society of Newspaper Editors or all the other, you know, kind of cabals where editors and publishers hang out and ask them if there was a crisis, the crisis would have nothing to do with concentration. It would be about survival because they all now sense uh, that they are uh, seriously endangered 
not by concentration, but by quite the opposite, by the fragmentation of um, both the sources of news and information and the places that advertisers can go on the internet, uh, niche cable, uh, satellite radio now, um, you know, you name it. There are lots and lots of places where, uh, I mean, advertisers have a lot more choices and to some extent they are deserting newspapers. Um, I guess we needed to say that the New York Times is owned by the Schultzberger family and Slate is owned by now the Washington Post, which is the Graham family. For yeah, as, as of about five months ago, before that, we were owned by Microsoft, where everyone was very suspicious that we'll be subject to some sort of nefarious corporate control. In my, in my experience, actually, both are identical in the sense that they are totally hands-off editorially, which is, which is great from my point of view, but I think also points to the fact that corporations, if for whatever reason they want to own media properties, can be very good owners with a great deal of integrity. I mean, I think on, on this point that Lionel and Bill were both talking about, you know, there are, there are three great newspaper companies still run by three great newspaper families. The Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, each of which, although public, is controlled through a, a share A and B st share structure by, in effect, the families. Mm -hmm. And those three companies uh, honestly do not profit maximize the way just about every other publicly held company has mm -hmm. to. Um, whether there, I think there are, some, there are some concerns about concentration of ownership, and one of the concerns I have is that it may become less and less possible for those, for those companies to do that. That is, for them to say, we are willing to pay a price in terms of reduced profitability because the values that, that are most important to us are the journalistic ones. And the other one, and I think this comes out of the same thing, as Lionel was saying, the, the move away at other media companies that were many of which were family run which are now not effectively controlled by the families but the distance between the best newspapers in the country and the rest has gotten bigger and bigger uh, there used to be a large number of second tier and i don't mean that critically but but not the leading newspapers in this country but very good newspapers like the miami herald like the philadelphia inquirer like the chicago tribune and i think if you went back 30 years and picked up most of those papers and put them alongside the Washington Post and the New York Times. There was a gap, but it's nothing like the gap there is now. And those papers, many of them, really are in decline. And I think it's a concern. I think there are many other things going on in the media, and we'll get to some of this, that counteract that in a very positive developments. But I think it's a shame that when you go to other cities around the country and pick up the morning newspaper, which some of us above the age of 40 still like to do, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Many of them just are, are extremely disappointing in terms of their, their basic journalistic quality. So the first surprise uh, was to hear that there's a huge swath of journalism that does not perceive itself to be directly affected by corporate controlled media concentration. Uh, largely the newspapers that are owned by families, families uh, that are proud of a legacy of serious journalism. Uh, so for these editors, um, the crisis isn't one of media concentration, but of the fragmentation, as Bill Keller says here, of both the sources of news and information and the places that advertisers can go. I mean, they do speak to um, what has happened with uh, the corporate uh, control uh, and the uh, seeking of maximum profits from other uh, great newspapers around the country. Just so you know, um, we also tried to include on this panel editors and managing editors who weren't so immune to bottom line pressures as these editors are, uh, specifically from the Los Angeles Times, uh, which is being squeezed for huge profits by its corporate parent, the Tribune Company. But as it turned out, uh, not one was available on May 7th. The second surprise in the discussion was the editor's response to the crisis of fragmentation, especially the vast deconcentration of sources on the internet. Okay, we're going back to the tape. Uh, Bardak is asking, what happened to the idea that the internet is the answer to media concentration? 
some of the ideas that uh, uh, Leah Levro was touching on just before me. Um, that the internet will make us free. Everybody can be a journalist. Everybody can be a blogger. Uh, there was also the idea that the, or the hope, uh, that the internet could fill some of the deficiencies in mainstream journalism. Uh, with all the corporate cost cutting of newsrooms, uh, one of the first things to go is investigative journalism. So Bardak asked Jacob Weisberg why internet magazines like his, Slate, uh, haven't picked up the slack. Oh, and by the way, I'm glad that Leah came before me with uh, her uh, 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 vision of uh, bottom-up, alternative, do-it-yourself um, work, because uh, I edited this tape myself, okay? And, uh, but as the TV people said, we can fix it in post. So, could we go next, Matt? that they would want to seize the, the opportunity to, that's, that's well, available to them. In, investigative reporting is, is difficult for internet publications for, for a bunch of reasons, and, and probably the biggest one is what Bill said, yeah. it's resources, it's expensive to do, and mm -hmm. the business has not developed to the extent that you can really finance that, although I think, I think it will. But, the, but there are other more sort of tedious issues. I mean, people don't like to read long stories on a computer. Investigative stories tend to be long, you know, they're multi parts. It's not the kind of thing that, that works online. Online, in Slate in particular, things have to be sort of boiled down, you know, made pithy, like the questions we're going to have at the end of the session. Um, but, um, but, you know, but, but this is all in flux, and none of this is a, is a permanent situation. I mean, I, I spoke to a uh, journalism class at New York University several weeks ago, and it was a class of seniors, journalism students, really smart group of about 20 or 25 mm. stu college students. And mm. I asked them, because I was curious, how many of you read the New York Times newspaper? And I'm sorry to tell you, not a single hand went up. Mm. And I was, I was a little disturbed by that. When I was in college, I read the newspaper every day, the New York Times, most people I knew did too. And I said, how many of you read the New York Times on the web? And every single hand went up. Mm -hmm. And I was very relieved. And all that says is that the audience for your product is not going away. It's just migrating to a different form. And there are some, there are some very big practical hurdles in making that transition. Uh, perhaps the biggest one being this economic problem that it's hard to see right now how the, even a very good online business generates the kind of revenue you would need to support the robust reporting operation you have. But, I firmly believe it'll happen, and you know, whether it takes 15 years or 20 years or 25 years, the New York Times may end up with a much bigger, in fact, it already has a much bigger audience than it's ever had because of the web. Right. Um, it is a question of figuring out, and luckily this is the job of our publishers, not our job, but <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> someone is going to have to figure out how to monetize this for us so we can still continue to do the kind of journalism we want to do. But if every uh, This is an eccentric view in mm -hmm. old media, which I guess I <laughs> yeah. represent here. <laughs> Um, but but I actually think Jacob's right. I I I don't see the the profusion of new voices on the internet as uh, as a threat. Um, you know I uh, I th first of all I, I mean I I read them I love them I think they're good for us they provide a, a, a kind of stimulus. Sometimes it feels like a cattle prod, but, <laughs> but they, you know, they keep our feet to the fire. Uh, you know, a lot of them aren't even news. They're, you know, they're just they're sort of resources that that all of us use, uh, and a lot of gossip, and a lot of propaganda, and a lot of polemic, uh, and all of that is, you know, is great fun. Um, but. You know, I'm, I'm going to slip into economic jargon here, and, and afterwards Lionel's going to tell me that I made a complete fool out of my, <laughs> myself. But um, you know, this is the barriers to entry in the media market have essentially fallen to almost nothing. And what do you do in an easy entry market? You move up the value chain, isn't that what they say? <laughs> you, you come up with some, you offer some assets that the new competitors can't offer. Mm -hmm. And first and foremost, uh, the asset that the old media offers is reporting. And by that I mean the whole complex of, you know, we have 350 reporters at the New York Times and they go out and witness stuff and they write it up and we have editors who put it in place and we have photographers who bring back pictures. And, you know, the blog world 
uh, you know, is wonderful, but it isn't enough. And I, and I do think that we will, there is enough of a demand for actual reporting that we will make that transition. Um, and, well, a few, of, a few of us will, anyway. <laughs> will the internet ever just, take uh, to you, but it, you know, it, knowing more about some uh, su I mean, esoteric subject. The theory subject. You're, you're ridiculing is absolutely true. It, newspaper, first of all, newspapers are filled with mistakes. Yes. They are much less filled with mistakes now. Because I'm sorry, that. there are many fewer mistakes because they are, after publication, essentially peer-reviewed by, uh, by millions of people around the world collectively, who collectively know everything. And we'll let you know in, in no uncertain or polite terms when you have erred. And as a result, they are making newspapers much more accurate. Now, the fact that there are lots of blogs that are published that are inaccurate and aren't cor uh, corrected is largely because those blogs aren't significant enough for anybody to bother to correct them. If you make a mistake in a prominent blog, you will be roundly denounced, ridiculed, corrected by other bloggers, by readers. There's an immediate feedback mechanism which does constitute this kind of massive post-publication peer review. And I do believe that the result is greater accuracy both for them and in particular for old media. I'm not arguing with you about whether uh, blogs constitute a, 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 a kind of reality check, uh, a, a, you know, an extra line of defense. I'm quarreling about whether they're a substitute. Uh, and, yeah. and I don't think yet that they are, although they may be, because what I th think, you know, I'm sort of straying out on a speculative <laughs> limb here, but what I think is happening, is that we're beginning to see the beginnings of a convergence. Uh, we are seeing a lot more uh, newspapers beginning to operate in something closer to real time. I mean, you know, the New York Times says for six or seven years had a continuous news desk. We update news during the day. The Washington Post does that. A lot of newspapers are doing blogging. I'm not you know, quite in the, in the uh, fashion of the Wild West bloggers, but they are doing blogging. And on the other hand, you know, the biggest news story uh, of the last couple of months in, uh, in the internet world has been the fact that Yahoo News has hired editors because unlike Google News, where all you get is an aggregation of information that's auto done by, uh, by a computer, uh, they think that people would actually be interested in having some human judgment exercised over the selection of the, the material they get when they do a news search on Yahoo. Well, the, the editors have advantage. So the second surprise here is that even though these top editors uh, see the fragmentation of sources uh, brought about by the internet as representing a crisis of sorts, uh, they don't feel especially threatened by it. Um, uh, by blogging, uh, they recognize some benefits of it uh, and even see a productive convergence of mainstream news gathering and blogging. Uh, uh, to be truthful though, uh, when uh, Lionel Barber spoke about uh, bloggers, uh, Lionel Barber, the U.S. managing editor of the uh, Financial Times, um, uh, he does not agree with Bill Keller and Jacob Weisberg uh, about uh, the benefits of this convergence of blogging of, of the internet and mainstream news gathering. Uh, and he thinks that uh, unqualified bloggers who are just out there making wild accusations against people do a lot of harm. So um, this gives us a lot uh, this gives us a lot to think about here. Um, I, I didn't know that uh, mainstream editors had done this much thinking and this much kind of non-paranoid thinking uh, about uh, the internet and bloggers and what that effect was going to be on mainstream news gathering and dissemination. Now, I di I'm just finishing up here. I didn't include in this summary uh, the editor's discussion of bias in the media, not linked to media concentration or deconcentration uh, because it seemed a bit off topic for today's event. But it was very interesting and again surprising, or perhaps not. Uh, just very briefly, all three editors said that they didn't feel that the problem of media bias was ideological, but rather stemmed from internal pressures in the journalistic institution. Uh, wanting the scoop, having to suck up to get access, uh, making the mistake of being too credulous. Uh, as Bill Keller says elsewhere in the panel discussion, the idea that this is all kind of ideologically governed is largely, greatly exaggerated 
I would say that's even true of Rupert Murdoch if you want to come down to it, echoing something that Ellie Nome said this morning. Um, I, and he go, Bill Keller goes on to say, I think that, much of, that most of the distortion that happens at the New York Times has to do with people trying to take information and turn it into a compelling story. They want a story that will get put on the front page. They want a story that will make their competitors envious. They want a story that people will read. In its most benign form that consists of trying to order the story in such a way that you draw readers in and keep them reading. In its more malign form, it comes from being insufficiently skeptical of something that somebody has told you because, damn, that would make a good story. This view uh, that bias results solely from internal institutional pressures to get a good story runs counter to Howard Friel's and Richard Falk's analysis in the record of the paper how the New York Times misrepresents <coughs> U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Library Journal have said of their book, Friel and Falk have produced a meticulously researched and damning indictment of biases in the venerable paper's reportage related to U.S. military operations. At the very least, the record of the paper suggests that the New York Times and other papers as well tend to more strongly go into spasms of being insufficiently skeptical when it comes to war reporting, more so than at any other time. Thank you. All right, I think that better. Um, let me start with a question for Leah. To what extent can the difference between access in the mass media paradigm and access in the internetworking paradigm be understood as the difference between reading and writing? I think the interesting element there is the question to what extent those two are balanced. Because I think when we talk about literacy, and there's sort of a vogue now for talking about different kinds of literacies, visual literacy, numeracy, all these plays on that, I think both are involved. And yet when we talk about the, at least the way that I framed access in the mass media model, it is about consumption, it's about reading, it's about about reception, as, as a lot of the people in communication and media studies will talk about reception. Um, but writing um, has, is its complement. And, and there are different kinds of, you become a better reader when you, we all know, you read better when you write, and you write better when you read. And, and so I think um, one of the things that certainly the clip that we were just looking at illustrates is that there's a, uh, it's not an either-or thing. I think this is this is one of the the real pressures uh, in communication research. There's a long history of thinking that every new form, every new genre, is going to replace the old ones. Right? It's like this su supplanting discourse, and so far that really hasn't happened. You know, Marshall McLuhan always talked about it in terms of the old medium becoming the content of the new. He had his little aphorisms about that. But really, it's a, it's a combinatorial thing. People are not going to stop watching television. People are not going to stop reading. We are probably reading more because there's so much text-based stuff online. It's not as visual as it could be. So I, I think, in fact, this opposition is a little bit false. I think there's no way to talk about blogs or public opinion blogs very effectively unless there's sort of a big received body of opinion to push against. There's got to be something for the blogosphere or the people who are, who are um, interacting in those circumstances to be talking about. And um, they may create some of that themselves, but just as these uh, gentlemen on the tape illustrate, you know, reporting at, it is a very labor-intensive, very capital-intensive kind of thing. And so I think uh, 
you know, opposing those two is not the way that I think about it. I think that they're complementary. And I think uh, your point about each form of communication adding uh, rather than substituting is something we certainly struggle with in my field uh, because we can't get, ever get rid of anything. <laughs> Uh, let me address this question initially to Connie, Connie, but you may also want to add on to it, Leah. Uh, do you think there is a distinction between journalism and information dissemination? And is it not the responsibility of editors uh, to make those judgments that may not, in fact, maximize profits? I hope I'm not going to be... I hope I'm not going to be expected to channel and Louise Bardak and Virginia Postrel and Bill Keller and Jacob Weisberg and um, um, uh, Lionel Barber. But um, I, I could tell you uh, a few of um, the things that uh, the editor said. And also, after um, that, the panel was on the Saturday of May 7th, and uh, on the next Monday, there was a piece in the New York Times uh, where um, uh, Bill Keller, actually this had happened before Bill Keller came to the Times in 2003, this was after the Jason Blair plagiarism uh, problem. Uh, the um, a committee was put together uh, to um, think about a way that the New York Times and perhaps other media, uh, other journalism, uh, could change their practices and their habits uh, to be able to uh, gain more credibility from their readers. Um, as you could see, Bill Keller here, the executive editor of the New York Times, uh, you know, does feel a bit beleaguered. Um, uh, so what they put together was um, a, a set of guidelines uh, uh, about the kinds of principles they should be working under so that editors and journalists uh, could regain this credibility. And uh, some, of the, um, some of the things were uh, um, use the web to provide readers with complete documents used in stories as well as transcripts of interviews. Um, uh, uh, further curtail the use of anonymous sources. Um, uh, encourage reporters to confirm the accuracy of articles with sources before publication and to solicit feedback from sources afterwards. Um, encourage the development of software to detect plagiarism when accusations arise. I mean, we've already got that, you know, in the universities. We know how to catch our students. Yeah, um, uh, and um, and encourage the executive editor and the two managing editors to share responsibility for writing a regular column that deals with matters concerning the newspapers. And this was a really top one. Turns out that the New York Times, uh, uh, readers have uh, less access to journalists than at any other kind of mainstream newspaper. So make reporters and editors more easily available through email. You can imagine all the journalists are just going up. Oh, but anyway, so, I mean, you know, the people on uh, the panel are very much trying to think about um, the kinds of principles and guidelines uh, they should use to be able to uh, be credible and be more in touch with their readers. Um, the question was, is there a difference between journalism and information dissemination? And the difference is reporting. I mean, and it is bias. I'm, uh, you know, I'll put my little former journalism school hat on and just say, you know, we need the witnesses. We need the human eyes there. You did, there's no such thing, in my view, philosophically, as a completely objective reporter. That's, I mean, it's just not going to happen so long as pe you can be fair, you can be balanced to some extent, but you're never going to get that sort of golden ideal, which I think is a very interesting sort of late 20th century idea that we have about journalism, and I think it's the thing that allows us to think that we have adequate journalism in a city with one newspaper. Because if it's objective, why do you need anything else? If you've reached that ideal, right? But if you think about journalism in terms of voice, if you think about it in terms of the eyes and the, and the witnessing, the, the, the being there of the reporter, which is really what they were talking about here, I mean, that's what costs, that's where the quality is, 
you know, and that's what's kind of being beaten up in the current climate. And so I think that's the difference. Journalism is about the witnessing. It's about the, the reporting. Information dissemination, once you have an object, you can move it around however you want to once you've commodified it. But it's that original creation that really makes the difference. Um, this morning we heard both Ellie Noam and Bill Warner uh, referring to, in a very relevant way, the actions in the 18th century of Ben Franklin and his press. However, as we look at the kinds of new media that you discussed, which you in fact pointed out, how perishable and dynamic and changing they are, uh, how are we going to study uh, 200 years from now the history of new media? Uh, is, there, is it ever going to be able to be stored? Are we just going to read about it indirectly? Have you thought about that? I happen to be part of a department that thinks about that a lot. Uh, digital preservation is like one of the great, someone described something at lunchtime today as sort of the black hole. That's the black hole here. Um, all of us have stuff that's sitting in a shoebox on a floppy disk that can't be read anymore. It's gone for all intents and purposes. No machines will read it anymore. It can't be ported forward without extraordinary effort. Sometimes it can't be done at all. And I think that one of the things about studying this moment, which has got a lot of people in film archiving, for example, moving image archiving, we have a program in that now at UCLA, um, it's almost as though the digital problems are, are less understood than the material, sort of the photographic stock, those kinds of things. That's, they're bad problems, but they're somewhat better understood. I think years ago, a, a colleague of ours, Sari Thomas at, at, um, at uh, Temple University, uh, gave a conference paper called um, The Death of Intellectual History and the Rise of the Transient Past, or something like that. And, and her point was, we don't ha we're not keeping records. The records don't endure. And she wasn't even thinking about the internet particularly, but she was thinking about the fact that uh, to the extent that we depend on phone calls, that we depend on more and more sort of ephemeral ways to interact rather than documentary ones, there's no record to talk about. So there's a lot of people, there are a lot of digital archivists, not a lot of them, there's a few of them, but they're, they're very concerned about this question. Um, and right now, it's a very open worry because we, we don't completely know how we're, how we're even going to choose what to keep. It's, a, it's an astounding problem to decide what it is that's going to be worth keeping. Um, maybe Connie could start, but this is another question that could go to each of you. Uh, do you think organizations that are using the internet will be able to increase the diversity of the consolidated press, meaning perhaps the more traditional press, or will they stay separated? Uh, and the questioner gives the example of uh, indie media coverage of RNC protests versus a New York Times mostly non-existent coverage of uh, the same events. And so um, will there be the kinds of interactive influence uh, that you talked about, or will they remain as sort of oppositional polls? I think it, I think it will be... Uh, I think we'll see every possible variation. Um, uh, I think that there will still uh, continue to be uh, independent media that is oppositional. Uh, and by the way, uh, we have a table for Santa Barbara independent media here in the back of the hall with a lot of their literature on it. You might pass by that table on your way out. Uh, and then I think we're going to see uh, the kind of convergence that Bill Keller was talking about here, where there's very much an interaction between uh, online media uh, and uh, mainstream journalism. Um, I think, uh, say what the question was one more time, please. You think organizations using the internet will be able to increase the diversity of the more consolidated press? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I would think that given the, the kinds of um, patterns that we have now, as one places like Slate, for example, begin to look like they might be viable, you know, as as properties, uh, they might end up being co-opted. Um, there may be a, 
in fact, and Ellie's um, data suggests that maybe there's already some concentration beginning to happen in this sector already. And um, so I wouldn't bet so much on endless proliferation. Kind of depends on the way that we decide to um, to regulate or not, and and the, the economic incentives and disincentives to do one thing or another. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's an open question right now. Thank you both. Uh, please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.